this lecture, I'm going to talk about cellular injury, a very important basic of pathology. To simplify, we're going to break it down into three parts, cellular adaptation, mechanism of cell injury, and cellular death. When a cell is being subjected to stress or pathological factors, it can survive the injury and adapt to it, or it can die if the stress is persistent or excessive. Now let's focus on cellular adaptation, which happens when the cell is able to survive that stress. We have four types of cellular adaptations. These are hypertrophy, hyperplasia, atrophy, and metaplasia. This slide is really, really important. It's the most important two minutes in the whole um, video, okay? Now you know that a change in the environment of a group of cells can lead to reversible changes in those cells. And bear in mind the word reversible. Let's start with hypertrophy. Imagine that this cell is required to do more work by the body due to a change in the environment of that particular cell or the body as a whole. And this cell wants to produce more work and the only way it knows how is to increase in its size. So it's going to get huge to produce more work. Now another kind of cell is required to do uh, extra kind of work as well, but this particular cell is able to divide. It is going to divide eventually, leading to more cells that would lead, lead to more work. You can see that the actual net result of hyperplasia and hypertrophy is pretty much similar because both of them would lead to an overall increase in the size of the organ, okay? And when you look at the two words, they both start with the word hyper, which means more. The word trophia means nourishment, so it means you have more nourishment. Looking at hyperplasia, plasia means formation, so you have more formation, more cells. Now looking at atrophy, it's really easier than the first two. You have a cell that is not required to do more work, the complete opposite. So why would it need to stay the same in its size and burn more energy? It's obviously going to shrink to reserve that energy. And look at the word atrophy. Trophia, we talked about trophia, it means nourishment. And the word, the letter A means no nourishment. So the cell is starving and it has shrunk. Lastly, metablasia is really interesting, it's fairly different than the previous three adaptations. Now you have this kind of cell that would change into another type of cell, okay? Imagine that this cell is a fireman that lives in a city with a very low fire rate, so it's, it does not really do much work anymore, and the same city has a very high crime rate. So this cell thinks that it might be able to do better if it converts itself into a policeman. So it does, and it becomes another kind of cell. So it's a change in the function of the cell. Let's talk about these adaptations in more detail. I summarized all of these in three slides. Let's start with hypertrophy, obviously. Um, as we said, it is an increase in the size of the cell that will lead to an increase in the size of the organ. And we have no new cells, just bigger ones. And the cell type has a limited capacity to divide, that's why it enlarges in its size. Now, there is something really important here that you need to understand uh, is the types of hypertrophy. It can be physiological or pathological. And what's the difference between these two things? Physi physiology is normal body functioning. So hypertrophy can actually be beneficial to your body. Now, moving on to the triggers of hypertrophy, we have um, an increase in functional demand. Uh, growth factor and hormonal stimulation are very, very similar. They are both chemicals that would communicate with the cell through its receptors and to tell the cell to increase in its size. But the first one is a growth factor and the second one is a hormone. Moving on to the examples of hypertrophy, we had physiological examples and we have pathological ones. Starting with the physiological, the first one is very, very basic. It's the enlargement of the uterus during pregnancy. Look at this first picture. So the first picture here is a cross-section of the myometrium. 
or the smooth muscle cells of the uterus. As you can see, these are small, spindle-shaped. The second picture, however, and believe it or not, it's of the same magnification, is a cut section of a gravid uterus. And the word gravid means pregnant. And as you can see, the cells are large, plump, and hypertrophied. And you can easily see the difference between the two. What's the trigger here? It is basically hormonal stimulation. You have a spike of estrogen during pregnancy and it tells those small muscle cells to increase in their size. The second example is better at demonstrating uh, how hypertrophy works. Imagine that you have a person who wanted to become a bodybuilder and start, that person started to lift weights as you can see here. This person would have to do extra work compared to the usual routine. So they are going to hypertrophy. And as you can see here, the trigger is an increase in functional demand required from those cells by the bodybuilder. Now moving on to the pathological example, cardiac enlargement due to aortic valve stenosis. Now we need to break this down. Let, let me do a little drawing here. This is the left atrium and this is the left ventricle and between them is the mitral valve. This is the aorta, and this is the aortic valve. Now we're talking about aortic valve stenosis, and a stenosed valve is a stiffened valve. Now the blood will struggle to get out through the aortic valve, and the muscles that line the left ventricle, which, is, which are cardiac muscles, will strain and do extra work to get this blood out. Now, why this is not a good thing? You can see here, this is a cross section, and this is the left ventricle, and this is the right ventricle. You can easily compare between the two, and this is not a good thing. Why? Read this note here. Hypertrophy has a limit. After that, functionally significant cell injury happens if the stress is not relieved, okay? Hyperplasia is an increase in the number of the cell, leading to increase in the size of the cell, new cells original size and the cell type is the type capable of replication. The types are the same physiological or pathological and the triggers are basically the same increase in functional demand, growth factor or hormonal stimulation. Examples of hyperplasia. Hormonal examples the proliferation of breast epithelium at puberty and during pregnancy in females due to estrogen and progesterone. They increase at puberty and allow breasts to develop and then they increase even more during pregnancy to allow the breast to lactate in the future. The second example is the compensatory hyperplasia which is fascinating really. Imagine that you have two people, one with a sick liver and the other with a normal one. Um, the one with the normal liver will, will donate a portion of their liver to the second person. Now the first person is going to have section cut from his liver. Can you imagine that? The remaining part of the liver would release growth factors and these growth factors would stimulate the remaining portion of the liver to increase in their number and they will, in a period of weeks, this person who donated the liver would have regenerated the original weight of their liver. This is really amazing. Pathological examples are two as well. The first one is the endometrial hyperplasia due to hormonal imbalance. The endometrium is the lining of the uterus right here and it is under the influence of estrogen and progesterone and when there is an imbalance between these two hormones, the endometrial cells undergo hyperplasia. Now, why is it a bad thing? You can actually have a focus of uh, hyperplasia somewhere in the uterus. Why is it bad? Read this note right here. Hyperplasia mostly remains controlled, but sometimes pathological hyperplasia may lead to cancer. You're going to understand that hyperplasia in most of the cases is a very crucial step in the early uh, steps of malignancy. The second example is really easy, which is the hyperplastic epithelium of skin warts by human papilloma virus. This is basically a virus that would stimulate your epithelium of your skin and it will create a wart, a visible wart on your skin. And the word wart means thalul in Arabic. 
Atrophy is basically the loss of cell substance that would lead to shrinkage in the size of the cell and the organ. The cell is not dead, but it has less function. And the same thing goes for atrophy. It can be physiological or pathological. Now, the mechanism of atrophy revolves around protein. It's basically protein loss. You have less protein synthesis plus more protein degradation. The causes of atrophy can be physiological or pathological, okay? The physiological causes revolve around aging, basically. The first one is menopause. Meno comes from the word uh, menstrual period, of obviously, and pause means no more. And what happens is at that point, you lose the endocrine stimulation to the endometrium. So the endometrial cells would shrink and then the blood supply around them would diminish and then there will no longer be any menstrual period. Senile atrophy is another example and I think it's really obvious to connect this with the actual life when you see an old person, old people are obviously atrophied. Moving on to pathological examples. First, when you have a decreased workload, you would have an atrophied muscle. For example, look at this picture right here. You can see this is the humerus, your funny bone. Imagine that you have broken this bone. Now we need to put this, your arm in a cast for maybe six weeks. The muscle that moves your bone will not be moving anymore for a while. So it will shrink for the time being and it will turn to look like this and actually this does not happen at a cellular level alone but you can actually see it can you compare between these two hands the bulk of the second hand is different than the first one because the first one is obviously was not really moving much the second example is the, is the loss of innervation imagine the same muscle but without the nerve that moves it just like the bone, without the nerve, the muscle would not be able to move, so it won't burn any nutrients, so it wouldn't really need much, and it will shrink. Diminished blood supply and adequate nutrition are the same, are basically the same thing. The word atrophy comes with the word autophagy, which means self-eating, and uh, it's going to eat its own components to survive, and this is just so sad. Lastly, we talk about metablasia. It's when a cell type changes into another type and bear in mind two important words. These are sensitive and capable. A sensitive cell type will turn into a capable cell type. Let's move on to the examples. The first one is the change in the respiratory epithelium of cigarette smokers. These are columnar ciliated with goblet cells perfect for the airways. Okay. But with time, when this person smokes and smokes for a long period of time, these cells are so sensitive they are not really able to tolerate the smoke. So they are going to slowly turn into squamous stratified epithelium. And just for a minute, let's skip for the disadvantages of metablasia and look at this. Loss of protective function of original type, which was the respiratory epithelium. And the second one is malignant transformation. This is very, very important. We have already said that hyperplasia can be the first step towards cancer. Metaplasia has the same potential, especially that it happens over a long period of time. A second example is the chronic gastric reflux. And I will draw a little drawing here. This is the esophagus and this should be the stomach. And there is a little valve between them that prevents the acidic fluid of the stomach from going into the esophagus. Now we know that the lower esophagus is lined with stratified squamous epithelium. And the stomach is lined with gastric or intestinal type columnar epithelium. Now the second type is able to tolerate the acidic fluid because this is its environment. And it shouldn't really go into the esophagus. But... For any reason, if the acidic fluid escaped into the esophagus, that's why we call it gastric reflux, it will harm the stratified squamous epithelium of the esophagus. And it happens over a long period of time. And the, this change 
has a potential of malignant transformation and chronic gastric reflux is the major cause of esophageal cancer. This concludes our cellular adaptation lecture.